So I'm uh, Christian Nielsen. I'm a long time uh, MariaDB and former MySQL developer. Uh, I implemented uh, some MariaDB replication features, uh, group commit transaction, global transaction ID, and parallel replication. I have a free software I developed for a long time and I want to do consulting independently. So in this talk, I wanted to be a little bit um, philosophical and I want to define what I think is the very core on MariaDB replication. And then I'm trying to show how that in turn determines some of the key properties of how replication works. Uh, so, so what is uh, core? So this is, uh, in the core we have a master server. It runs some transactions in parallel out of, uh, in different orders. We have multiple connections. And then when a transaction commits, we write the transaction into what we call the binary log, the bin log and we write it in the order that the transaction commits. So that's very basic. And the fundamental, I call it the fundamental axiom is that when we have this binary lock with a sequence of transactions, if we on the slave apply, apply them one after the order, in, uh, one after the other in order, we get the exact same data on the slave as we get on the master. So this is the kind of a fundamental axiom how verification works. Just to make it more concrete, so here's a diagram. Uh, uh, so we have here three transactions. So T2 is the one that starts, but T3 actually is the first one that does something. It deletes something, it inserts, T1 starts. And at some point, like here, it's, uh, they both try to update the same row, so they have to wait for each other. There's some synchronization needed. At the end, T1 commits first, then T2 commits, and then T3 commits. So in the bin log, we have those in sequence. And now the fundamental action says that if we apply this, it will always give the same result on the slave. And, and that's actually a very strong property, especially for statement-based, if you have, have SQL statements. Like I think, and the reason it works is that InnoDB has some very uh, intricate locking. It has not just exclusive row locks, it has shared row locks, it has these uh, gap locks and uh, insert intention locks. So it's really a lot of work went into making that work and making it work efficient. But this is a really the, the property that we have this, uh, this fun, uh, so as I say, if you apply them in sequence on the slave, we get the same. Remember, they will run in parallel on the master, but they run serially on the slave, we get the same, the, the same data. And this is the basis, basically, of the performance of a real replication. It performs really well. And also, it's very, very flexible compared to many other replication solutions. But it also gives some limitations. So that's what I want to kind of demonstrate a house important this actually is uh, but also i really like uh, having a like two-way dialogue compared to just me speaking for 45 minutes so just ask me anything about replication questions i'm happy to answer that on the way right okay so it has a depending on the access path which uh, secondary indexes if it's using it can acquire a different set of blocks or Right, so if you like do a table scan on the primary key um, in the clustered index, it will have an index record lock on the primary index. Yeah, that, that clustered index. Modify, okay. Uh, key index record, but uh, whether it locks any secondary index records, that's uh, depending on the access path. Right, that's a good point. Yeah, so we know to be is actually clustered. Uh, index implementation, so it, the row, yeah, okay, it's interesting. But uh, on the slave, we basically always do a primary key lookup and, uh, and then update that one. We basically never use secondary index. Yeah, if there's a primary key, we still have the replications when the primary key is missing. I, I mean, statement-based replication, it uses whatever, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But, 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 let's say, but most production, uh, so there's no uses uh, okay. either row based or mixed mode yeah, mixed for mode, sure. Yeah, and mixed mode will basically use row based in most yeah. cases. Yeah, I mean yes. So so definitely row based replication is much simpler. So statement based replication is actually very scary. But even if you have row based on the on the on the slave, you still have the SQL statement on the master actually. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's so we'll start with one, uh, one um, consequence of this. Uh, we have a parallel, parallel replication, especially what we call in-order parallel replication, uh, which was implemented uh, some years ago. 
So we don't, we have this action apply the, if we apply the um, transaction one after the other, it works. We used to do that. It's not what we want to do for performance. It's too slow, right? Modern hardware, we need to do it in parallel. So how can we do that? And the idea in this in-order parallel application, it's also called optimistic parallel replication on the user level. It is that we just try to run everything in parallel, just start it. We have 10 transactions, just start them in parallel. But when they commit, we make sure that they commit in the same order as they did, as they are in the bin log, which is the order that they were in the master. And sometimes that can result in conflicts, but if it's a conflict, we detect it quickly and we resolve it. Uh, so like in the ideal case, so imagine this is the binary log. We have transactions one, two, three, four, five, so on in sequence. And now we have four threads. So let's say we just start one, two, three, four. We start them and they finish. And when they finish, we commit them and then we start the next one. So if all the transactions are the same size, <laughs> and they schedule perfectly on the threads, then we have the perfect scaling, but of course, that's not very realistic. So what happens in this uh, in-order parallel application in practice is that uh, the transactions start, and maybe number three here is a little bit delayed. There was some other thing going on on the machine. And then transaction two is much longer than the others. So remember, we had to commit them. We can start them at the same time, but we have to commit them in, this, in, the, in the same order. So three, four, and five, and six, they have to wait to commit until two committed. So we have some wasted time, which is kind of the light and colored uh, boxes here. We have a lot of time where transactions are waiting and also some time where they're not scheduled. So it, we actually need more threads than you would expect probably. And we actually should use a lot of threads with parallel application, I think, uh, more than just like number of cores or twice the number of cores. It, it is implemented so that they scale very well. So this is the idea of uh, parallel replication. And how can we sure this works? I don't know if you can imagine how many corner cases there are, especially in statement-based replication, of different, like their prime, their foreign keys, there are all kinds of selects, optimize a different path. How can we be sure this works? Like, <laughs> just run them in parallel, see what works. And there's an argument which is based on this fundamental uh, axiom of parallel replication. It is that even though we ran them in a very different order, these transactions will run in a different order on the, on the master, but we commit them in the same order. So that means that the bin log, which just reflects the commit order, the bin log is the same on the slave as it is on the master. So by this fundamental action, we know that they run, the bin log is identical, so they produce the same data. If we were to replicate it serially, it would give the same data. So they must be equal. And if there was somehow the parallel application would give a different result on, on the slave and on the master, that's already a bug in non-parallel application because the bin lock from the slave would then apply incorrectly on the secondary level slave. So it's kind of a relative correctness argument. If it works for serial application, then it also works for parallel application. I think that's a very strong property in this way. The reason that this was publishable to implement in a way that it, well, it works, so there's still bugs, but yeah, it was, uh, it wasn't like we had to, I had to consider every single corner case. I think it's a very strong property. Um, so I just want to mention, <laughs> this is a good theory, right? We have a correctness proof, uh, it's a relative, but, but there are some really tricky corner cases um, hit by federal application, which were bugs in the interview, you could say, but it's something that wasn't triggered before. This is from memory. Maybe, I think it was like this, we had some transactions. Four transactions, they all update the same key. They all update the same primary, the same row. Uh, so there's an update of this row. Then after that, there's a delete of that row. Then after that, there's an insert of the same row and a delete again. So we just have a row, we delete it, we insert it, and we delete it. But on the slave, we run them in, in different orders. So the, we run, the, we delete the row, and then we delete it again. <laughs> and after that, we insert. But what happens is that they run in parallel, so the update takes a, a lot. So these are waiting, the two deletes are waiting. And then we do an insert, it's also waiting. But we have to commit the insert as, as number three. So what happened is that we insert the row, we delete it, we insert it again. But this delete already started, it was waiting for the log up here, and it missed 
because the row was, it saw that the row was deleted, it missed that it was inserted again. So this deleted nothing on the slave, pearl the slave, and this one, uh, this insert was then left. And it was uh, the second delete uh, silently uh, ended, right? Without purchasing any error. Yes, yes. So this, this delete was supposed to delete something and didn't delete it. And then later you'd get a duplicate key error. And it's a bug, but it's not very often probably that an application would delete its rows before it inserts them, right? It would be unusual for an application to run the delete for the insert. So that's probably what was caught before. So it's, it's tricky to get correct, but it's at least theoretically there is an argument why it works. Mm -hmm. Uh, but still, I think uh, this in-order parallel application is a very powerful feature. The good thing about it is that it just, it basically it just works. I was actually doing a benchmark for the second talk, and it was a little bit slow, and then I thought I'd just increase, you know, just a label parallel application. I didn't have to think about, does it work? In this case, do I need to partition my data? I just, uh, it, it just it, it, I could just do it, and it was faster. I think that's a very good property. And, and um, I think this is the key to have at some point, parallel application enabled by default, because this will be transparent to, to, to applications, and it will, uh, it has to work, of course, in all cases. But, but this is all the case. The reason we can think about doing this is because it matches with the fundamental action of replication that we have this product. But I'd really love to hear like real world experience of how this works in practice uh, is in order, if it performs well and if there are some problems. Yeah. What's time? It's pretty good. Okay, so another thing I want to mention with this um, Maria with replication is asynchronous. Because remember what we said this, uh, what I call the fundamental action. The bin log records the transaction in the order that we're committed. So what does that mean? It means fundamentally we cannot write to the bin log until we commit, which means we cannot start a transaction on the slave until it commits on the master. So that means it makes it asynchronous. So the transaction runs uh, on the slave after it. it so it's yes, and that's some work started to do that. And again, so I had this, uh, the core of replication is that it works in this way. And it doesn't mean that I say you should never like do it a different way. In fact, we want to do it better. As you say, we want to do stuff like this. But then we have to be sure, and this is kind of the point I want to, to give in this uh, talk, that it, if we do something more than this, following this fundamental action, you have to uh, think really carefully, because then you're no longer protected. You don't have this relative correctness argument that I use for parallel replication. It doesn't work anymore. You have to then consider, is this the correct? So we'll give some examples of that, yeah. Uh, because because it is, uh, uh, what was it? Yes, so, uh, so, so the problem with having uh, this asynchronous application is that because a transaction can only start on the slave after it committed on the master, we have a minimum lag of the slave, of the size of one transaction, if the transaction is it's long or event, like in the multi table, it means we have a lot of lag. So this is the fundamental thing we want. This is, I think, one of the key things to prove. And you say, maybe we can do, like you said, uh, optimistically run it. That's, uh, that's already a two-phase author, uh, which does this, uh, yeah. So that will be somewhat highlighted in my presentation. Yes. <laughs> and that's also another way to do it, uh, uh, it's called out of order power replication. But you should also realize that this asynchronous application is the key to two very important things. It's the key to get performance because the, the, the master is almost unaffected, uh, relatively unaffected by the replication because it's only at commit time you have to do a little bit of style. It can still be costly, but it's much worse if you had to do a distributed row, uh, record lock for every operation. And it also gives a lot and lots of flexibility. You can do really, some people are using a, a advanced to do it very uh, complex things, and this is also possible because it's asynchronous. What 
time we're finishing it. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about another aspect of this asynchronicity. What does it mean? We have this term durability. What does it mean? Some things. It's stated like this. If you have a successful commit, after a successful commit, your data will not be lost, right? That's a promise of durability. Sounds good, right? You read this. Data will not be lost, right? Sounds good. But it actually, while playing in, in this setting of replication, because it's asynchronous, it actually means that your commit will be delayed until after, right? And then it will fail. Because if commit fails after a long time, then you're durable because you didn't commit, right? So, so and, and, and it's actually the case that uh, you have these similar synchronous and enhanced similar synchronous. It doesn't protect you against data loss. Your data will still be lost if the commit doesn't go through. It's just that you have ability in the application to handle it if you handle the commit better. I, I don't, I think we all know this uh, example, you know, I don't know, it's maybe a stupid example. Like you type in a big web form, like in Jira or something, you type a long text, right? You spend half an hour doing it very carefully, and then you say submit, and then you get an error <laughs> because commit failed, right? So you lost your half hour of our work. I'm sure most people have tried this. But the database was durable, right? Because the commit failed, so we were durable. But the rest of the application was not two-phase committing with the database, so the data was still lost. I'm just not saying that durability is not a good property. I'm just saying you should not overestimate what it means, because you, most applications, like WordPress or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't have this durability itself. So you're going to lose data maybe in another place. You have to have a very careful application where every time you commit failure, you can retry and, and, and stuff like that. So it's, uh... and, and there is actually, so if you really, what you really want to have, of course, is that you, during your, uh, during your query, you have a transaction. And if the server you have disappears, you want the query to continue on the other servers in your cluster. It's kind of this way. And, and, and you have, you need for that, you need something like NDB or some other synchronous replication cluster. It's kind of, for me, it's the holy grail of databases. You want this cluster, it has some nodes, it's high availability because if a node fails, it just continues on the, on the remaining and also scales. If you're too slow, you just add more nodes. And this is the holy grail of databases, but it's hard to make, right? Otherwise, somebody would probably make it. But, but replication does provide higher availability of the database. So if the master goes away, you can fail over to a slave and your database is still running, but your actual queries will not uh, be saved. You will not lose the data of the actual queries from data point for, based point of view because we are asynchronous replication. In order to hand all transactional applications should do three tries. So. Yes, I agree. Do you think they do? <laughs> I think they do. Yeah, I don't think they do, but it depends. Some do, some don't. And of course, the, the higher level of uh, operation you are, the better you'll be there. But so, so you write your your web application. You like you, you when as a type user type, you save it in somewhere so that if your web browser crashes, you can recover it. Yeah. And you do that on the middle tier. And you do that, or if you have a bank or something like two-phase uh, transaction, of course durability is good. I'm just saying. There are places, many of the users that we don't see because they don't even know the user database. space. So they are on a different level. Well, it's lost again, I have a question. Just like Barry, The thing is that the need wasn't committed. So, so the data is saved only after commit succeeds. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, so, so you do 10 updates and after number five, your server disappears. Then you have five updates yeah. and the, the transaction will be lost. But as much as says, the application could then have saved the data and you can retry it. But not all applications are able to do that. I think I'll skip this. Uh, um, so, so another uh, important point about how this replication works is that we have this bin lock and the sequence defines exactly it. If you do them in sequence, we get the same data. So at every point in the bin log, if you have a three transactions, T1, T2, T3, when you applied one and two, at this point, the state of the slave after applying these two transactions, it's identified 
by a single point in the bin log, it's, it's a simple thing, right? It's just, you have a single position in the bin log and it identifies the state of the slave. So you, the slave can disconnect it's a spe specific state and it only has to remember where did it disconnect in the bin log, then it can connect again and, 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 uh, and continue from there. I think that's a very, very good property. It's uh, not just from this point of view and fundamental uh, how verification works, it's also very good for DBA. What is the state of my slave? You have a position. In the old days, it was just the position in the, in the actual file in the master, but now we have DTID, Global Transaction ID. And Global Transaction ID preserves this property. You just have one value, the Global Transaction ID, and it identifies where in, where is, what is the state of your slave? And, and so I really, when Global Transaction ID was, was uh, designed, I really want to preserve this property because of this way I think replication works at the fundamental level. And MySQL does it differently. I don't know if you're familiar with MySQL, but they have a GTI in set. Conceptually, the, the state of the slave in MySQL, at least when I looked at it last time, was conceptually it's the set of all GTID, all the identifiers that you ever applied. So it could be like 50% of them spread out. Uh, and this is more complicated, I think, for the DBA and for the system as well. So this was actually the reason that GTID in MariaDB is different from MySQL, which is a very big decision to make. It would have been nice to have the same, right? But I think it's, it, it's, it really, yeah, so that's the reason to, to make it simple and to have this one-to-one -one correspondence with this uh, bin log sequence. But again, I'd love to hear really like two instances. Actually, simpler operations. Of, how does it work? Mm -hmm. Perhaps someone disagrees. But... Yeah, someone disagrees. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, yeah. Um, and so, so this was again. Uh, <clears throat> so we had this. Uh, I said. I lied to you, right? I said DTID, we have a single DTID, a single identifier of the state of the slave. And now I'm going to give an example where we're actually going to violate this fundamental way it works. We're going to do something more. And, and how the, what is the consequence of that? So this is, uh, for global transaction ID, we also have to consider multi-source replication. In multi-source replication, we have two masters, yeah, and one of them two, and they replicate to a slave. So, so now we don't have uh, this uh, single bin log. We have two bin logs, right? We have two sequences. So the slave here will have one position, one position in M1's bin log, but another position down here. So we have two. Uh, um, I don't know if you can see down here. So this is, in this case, the, the position is two-dimensional. We have, it's called the domain. The first number is the domain, so in domain zero, we have the position of in M1, but in domain one, we have a different position. So, and we replicate from that, we replicate from S1 to S2. So that's just a single, so now S1 is an intermediate master. So it's just a single uh, bin log and a single replication, but we still want to have this two dimensional. We still need two, two streams, right? Because at some point, S2 was replicated from S1, just a single bin log, a single connection, but now we want to move S2 to be directly a slave of M1 and M2. So when it connects to M1, it needs to know where to start. And it needs a different place to start than M2. So that's why even in a single, if you just forgot about this, we can have multiple uh, domains. We can have multiple positions. So this violates this global fundamental principle, right? Now we have two positions, uh, but it makes this uh, multi-source uh, it makes DTID work well with multi source application. It just vectorizes using terminology. Right? Yes, so this is the reason that we have the main ID in, in the MariaDB global transaction ID. Um, I have a question. Yes. So the catalogs, uh, we may have somebody who has a, a catalog uh, shared by many, or a server shared by many. So we have a replication from on premise the catalog. But now we maybe want, and may, maybe lots of users that the same thing. And now we want to have, a, uh, maybe the user then wants to have that replicated to another place. So in other words, I mean, it, it is setting to say that replication stream only send uh, anything with domain, domain ID one forward. I think we, 
already have that? Do we have that? Yeah. Can you remember, Andre? We do. We do have some replication filters in domain. Yes, we have. Yeah, Maybe, but but we might need to check if the details because also if it filters on the master on the slave. I don't it's remember. Not because we are sending data to. I, uh, yes. I use, so we can't send anything that is uh, uh, and, and that's actually I had a conversation with I forgot who it was I think maybe that's something we could consider that some of the filtering could happen that now can happen on the slave yeah could also happen on the master yeah. we have this for one filter which is skip replication or a simple one but maybe it should be extended yeah I think it's a good point yeah and on master this time it has to be on master because we're going to be we are sending uh, we don't want to send everything in a catalog with lots of tenants mm -hmm. to another place so that we'll get all the data mm -hmm. from other users. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. So uh, just to complete this, uh, so uh, there's an, uh, another way uh, of, of so so because we have this property because of we we needed to have this property that we could have multiple streams from S1 to S2 for multi-source, but we can also do it without, uh, actually, there's another, let me take this point first. So, so when we have multi-source, just old-fashioned multi-source without pair replication, these two streams replicate in parallel. There's no reason that one should wait for the other. So we also want pair replication to happen here, between S1 and S2. And this is called out of order pair replication. If you set different domain IDs, if you have two, detail, two transactions, that have from different domains, for example, from M1 or M2, they are allowed to replicate in parallel freely without this ordering where one has to wait for it, because there is no order, right? There's no defined order between M1 and M2. But you can also set that explicitly. Because uh, you can set this DTI domain ID that defines the DTI, the domain for the next, the next, transaction, the next transaction that's going to commit. And this way you can specify explicitly as like, from the application that this uh, transaction can replicate without constraints against another. Uh, you typically use that for long running auto table. So if you have an auto table, you know it takes a long time, you can just set a different domain ID and it will replicate in parallel without delaying your slave, the other transaction on the slave. From the same master, right? From the same master. Yeah, from the same, for just one, just, just uh, like if you didn't have those, just uh, master slave. And I think this is a, Good. Uh, so, so, so what is it? This is nice, right? But now we left the, the, the this. Uh, we violated this fundamental action. So this relative correctness doesn't work anymore. So now it's the user's uh, responsibility that this altered table will not conflict with some of the following transactions until it's done. So now we've paid the price of having a no no play play. But now it's the user's. Uh, uh, responsibility to make sure it's correct, which is a high cost to pay, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think we are also in a mesh cluster with uh, every master connected to every master. And I'm using some kind of bit on GODMS. At some point, one of the nodes get isolated and pass to big nodes. Then this is the only way to, to recover the GPID is to set domain ID to uh, the missing, mm -hmm. because otherwise, uh, Say so could not be connected. I see. Because it's missing the pin nodes of GTI. Yes, yeah. By making an insert with the new GTID on another node, then the same will fetch it and you get the GTID domain ID. Yeah. 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 I'm happy to see, I didn't see you, I'm happy to see you. You're a very good example when I say Maria replication is very flexible because you're doing crazy things, but amazing things, right? Using this flexibility, which is not possible with some more restrictive uh, uh, synchronous replication, so that's uh, yeah, that's a good point. So, but you have to you have to have a high knowledge level of knowledge to understand what you're doing. But if you do that, you can actually do pretty uh, complex things. Yeah, and I think this is something that could be supported better because you need root access to do this currently uh, to yeah. set the yeah. Yeah, then it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, what's time? I think we are done now, right? So, yeah. Uh, skip the slave provisioning. I uh, just, yeah. So, uh, so that was, um, yeah, my point is that we have this fundamental property of having this sequencing 
which defines it, it it gives us the i think this is what gives us the flexibility and the performance and the success basically of readable application it also implies some limitations and we still want to try to like lift those but it requires good thought it's yeah um and and sometimes either so if you want to either we have to as a developer be very careful about all the corner cases or otherwise we're pushing the responsibility to the user like in out of the order parallel application it's very good for the user to be able to go to that level but it's harder to use yeah much you want to talk? Uh, you say the push because doesn't have it axiom yeah what, what, what does that imply? Yeah, uh, yeah so it was actually from memory so i didn't mention it but it's uh so so somebody from you no know, postgres correct me if i'm wrong uh, yeah, what's it? Yeah. So it's at some point I followed the Postgres that implemented serializability in their transaction processing, so that uh, when you run transaction on the on Postgres, the result is something that could have been. Uh, so, so you run to ten queries in parallel, but it's called isolation, right? It's ACID. It's isolation part. I in ACID isolation. It means that there is some order in which you could have run the transactions one after the other, and it would have resulted in the same uh, data. And they implemented that. It was not there before. And um, because they don't have uh, basically shared logs in, in Postgres and Oracle RDMS, as far as I know, that's a root cause. So, so, so they implemented that you had some order. But this order that you they exist in principle, it doesn't have to be the same order that they actually committed in, 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 in on the master so you, you you have the property that has isolation but you don't know the order that would have given that result so that's why it's a very well, one, one point it's a very strong property but again it's for statements right. not for row events it's simple for rows especially if you have a primary key mm -hmm. does it make sense so so postgres has also statement based applications now we have more physical and logical we have statement and we have do they have statement based replication? Huh? Do they have statement based replication in Postgres? Uh, yes, they use it for logical replication. They, do that. they can both physical. Uh, that they have logical replication, which uses yeah, row, row events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
then packing up the row events will be like, could be multiple gigabytes. So the replication now has to process multiple gigabytes of data instead of just a short SQL string. So in that case, it's hurtful, yes? And regarding this, when there is a massive bulk of data on the table, in mix mod, uh, you know the, the new condition that we force it to row on. Uh, I, think, I think the mix mode uh, deletes will always be row. I mean, there is, there is this, uh, in that side the server, there's a lot of logic to identify this query is not safe for statement-based replication. This means that it will either give a warning if you have statement-based, or it will switch to row mode automatically. Uh, and does it apply to your bulk update? In general, it's a very complicated question because there's a lot of conditions. And, you know, every version, does we find another, this statement cannot be run safely, so we add more. So hopefully most big bulk updates will use a statement in mixed mode, but in general, I would say it's hard to, mm -hmm. to hard to give a general yeah. statement. It, yeah, it's, but it's, yeah. It's basically, and for current transaction, you have like a big event or small events, then it's possible being committed with new block plans in the master. Yeah. Because of the, because it will dog as a group. Yeah. Uh, but it's very unclear to me when it was in statement and when it was in. Yeah, and it's because and it's, yeah, I, yeah, it shouldn't be undocumented, but it's because it's, it was, how was it determined? How was it developed? We started with most things with your statement, and then somebody realized, okay, but if you're doing this, uh, in some cases, this will not, we cannot make it work in statement based, so we mark it as unsafe. So that's basically ad hoc. Whenever a bug was found, or somebody thought about it, it was modified that this particular case, and it's not, sometimes it's a complicated combination of this and this, then we switch to row mode, but when do we do it? It's it's something that's evolved, and it doesn't have like a. It's not something you can write down on the, on, on one slide. The the, the, the reason for exactly. it. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a good question, but it's also a hard one to answer. It means that the replication knows about the transaction. No, it, so so. No, no. Yeah, so that's not how. So that's a, so so it would be. It's not like the 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 master is analyzing the transactions that are uh, running and trying to understand it. It's not that complicated. It's once that you just look at the SQL statement, you pass it, and then from the nature of the SQL statement, you know, you determine if there's some condition with other transactions where this could be a problem, and if there's any condition like that, you conservatively mark it as so it, it could be documented. It's it's not magic. It could actually be written down. The rules are just complex. Yeah, it's uh, about uh, but that deterministic. Fifth line of code, for example, if there's a limit, I know order by automatically mark. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, the engine doesn't support transactions, it's marked. If it doesn't sort of support gap blocks, it's marked, and so on. Well, the place where somebody disagrees with you, you can ask them. Uh, remember, that was about uh, not using resources. So our parallel threads waiting for. Order to commit. Mm -hmm. So this time they just add in these parallel workers. Right? Yeah, you. you the, Thinking about this figure on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, there maybe was another slide, but. Uh, yeah, there was another slide. Uh, they still uh, not using um, resources. They, they don't produce any work. I mean. Yeah. Actually, they don't use work. They are, they are waiting for the turn and then they, they, they yeah. also have other things running on the slave that would. I think there are two things that can be said. I mean, uh, on one hand, I totally agree. This is the main limitation of in-order parallel application is that it's in order. So you have all this that try to market with all this uh, yeah. like it's waiting. So and that is uh, it would be nice to not have it. But if you want to do things yes. in order, yeah. this is actually close to the optimal. I mean, this waiting is, if you want to preserve in order, in order is not just to ensure that you get the same data, it's also in, to, to guard against what we call phantom rows. The slave will never see, on the master, you never could see T4 committed and T2 not. That would be a phantom read. And we have the same property. So the, you don't have to think of the DBA. Maybe the application will fail if something suddenly it can see T4 too early. That never happens because we commit only at the end. So it's a very good property, but it's really costly also because you have to wait. And that's, but, but I think one thing that mitigates this is that uh, you, you can have many threads, right? So you could have, uh, 
Jean-Francois Gagné some years ago did a very good benchmark and he was benchmarking with several thousand threads and he was seeing scalability of his workload which was very many, many different sizes he was seeing it scale up to several thousand threads because it was just filling up this you can see this which had a huge one it was filling all the holes with so, and, and it with, with smaller transaction and it does scale like that it's but it's uh, I think the main problem is that you scale it by having many threads. It would be nice to have some kind of thread pooling so that you could have many transactions, but not a thousand threads, because that's probably hard for the code. Uh, I think that's an optimization that would be very interesting to do. Yeah. Actually, a weighted thread doesn't cost much. And, and, and the thread costs you, cost you basically two makes of memory. And I think that's why uh, it works, <laughs> right? Yes, yeah. yeah, so I don't know how it would, at least you could measure it if it's, yeah. 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 Anything else or is it time for lunch?